Hello, I'm Joshua Gans. Today I'm going to be talking about predicting identity, which is one of the uses we put big data to. I want to suggest here that some of the issues and trade-offs that have been suggested in this problem are ones that have been somewhat misplaced. And this is informed somewhat by Deron Asimoglu's research on networks and interactions on networks. To begin, I want to start with a motivating example that has been dear to my heart over the last year, and that is infection risk from COVID-19. The problem we face in managing a pandemic is that absent any information regarding who is infectious, we treat all as equally infectious and we have things like lockdowns and broad restrictions, social distancing and all those other consequences we don't like. The solution to this problem is that we need to predict who is more likely to be infectious so that we can just isolate them and thereby avoid the problem of essentially leaning into the error of treating everybody as infectious. Now I wrote one, in fact two books about this problem this year, so I've been thinking a lot about it, but I want to focus on a particular aspect of it that's relevant to this issue of predicting identity. So we have in notion the idea that if there's an infectious person, we can use testing and then if we test that person, they're positive, we isolate them so that they can't infect others. The problem with testing is unless we do it all the time for everybody, we're one step behind in the problem. Because by the time we actually have a positive test for someone, the chances are they have exposed others and their risk of infection has been increased. So what we want to do is to get ahead of this, we have designed various means of what is called tracing. Of understanding who this person may have had contact with and thereby isolating all of those contacts as well so that we can get ahead of the virus. So the signal is that exposure predicts infectiousness. If someone is infectious and you know who who's been exposed to them, you can therefore increase your risk assessment, your signal of them also being infectious and infected themselves. The decision that the signal is informing is to use the information to isolate those individuals. In other words, rather than isolate everybody, we're isolating a much smaller set of individuals. That's still with error, but it's a small error. There are two broad approaches to this tracing. One approach that's been done uh, in many countries, in particular in South Korea, is to use an enormous amount of information to identify the contacts of people who have been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. You track them on their phones, you track their transactions, you look at hidden cameras, and you put it all up on the web so you can see where there have been issues involved. And this all goes to a central authority that can also isolate, identify and isolate these people. The other way we've been thinking about exposure notifications is through an app such as this one, the COVID Alert app here in Canada. That app uh, doesn't do the same thing. What it does is it presumes people have a mobile phone with the app installed. And what that does is every time you're out there and you come into contact with another mobile phone, a key is exchanged and that is noted. It's noted on your phone. If somebody who you've come in contact with then tells the app that they've been diagnosed with COVID-19, the app then sends you alert and says you've been potentially exposed. Now, obviously, the South Korean example is very low privacy. There's almost no privacy at all. The Canadian example is extremely high privacy. No information is leaving the individual at all, or you don't even know who may have you may have been exposed to. And so in that regard, uh, it's very strong. Of course, if you haven't been exposed, had contact with many people, you might work it out, but it's very high privacy. Which of these two approaches has better information for the core issue of predicting who is infectious? The issue, both things do the same thing. Who have you had exposure to? There could be some nuance that inside, outside, how much, etc. Well, that's all uh, part of the thing, but it's not clear that the South Korean example actually provides more information uh, or better information than the app here. In fact, the app is very cheap relative to what is done in South Korea. The difference between these two approaches is in who receives and then acts on that information. The trade-off is the benefits and costs of decision authority allocation. Who gets to make the decision after that of what to do? That is what's different between these two approaches. And there are lots of issues associated. There's the enforcement issue of isolation. If you've been exposed, will you be isolated? There's the privacy issue of other things that might be revealed about who you've had contact with. And then there's uh, issues that drive you in the absence of enforcement to isolate, and that is altruism. You don't want to infect other people at home or at work or, or something like that. And that could be a motive as well. 
The problem is that we don't have a market to mediate the decision authority allocation. Both of these regimes arise because of laws in the countries. In South Korea, following the MERS epidemic, they relax privacy restrictions to allow this very centralized system. In Canada, they have not done that. Okay, But we have these trade-offs that are a wealth of individual costs and benefits and social costs and benefits. And we do not have even an attempt at a market to mediate these things. In other words, we've chosen a regulatory solution in both cases. What you want to do in this situation is you want to price externalities. There's a recent paper by Deron and his co-authors just coming out on externalities in the pricing of data. One way would be to pay people to give up their privacy, that is to allow the decision authority to be centralized or to pay not to have that. We don't have that sort of mediation going on at all. So the question is actually, can we reframe the decision problem and the information required for it to overcome some of these issues? And I think the answer is yes. Here's what we typically have. We've got you there, you've got your family, you've got your friends. Someone gets, this is, you're really only tracking your one degree of separation exposure, anyone you've had actual contact with, and that gives you immediate exposure information. The problem with that is that information of that immediate exposure is in some sense a little too late. The only thing you can do once you get that notification that you've been exposed is actually engage in some sort of costly action like isolation. But if you used information regarding the entire network, you can do something different. The exposure in the network is a degree of separation. So three, two or four degrees of separation may be confirmed to have COVID-19. And they've exposed some people immediately to them. But we're still a little ways of that getting to you. But we can see, if we have the network information, the path for that. And so you can have advanced prediction of increasing this risk in the network. And that allows you to take a different set of actions. You could mitigate risk before exposure. You can say, oh, there's, there's increased prevalence in my network. I should take care in even dealing with my friends. I should maybe upgrade my mask, all sorts of things that I might choose to do to mitigate that risk. In other words, that is a whole new set of action items that are possible with that information. And ironically, this could be actually more private because when you receive a distant notification, it's not a notification of somebody you've had immediate contact with. It's only someone who you could have contact with based on your history of interactions and their history of interactions and so on and so forth. And so it's potentially more private than you get what you get with an immediate exposure notification. And so there's an app that does this, the Novid app. This app can augment this information on the network with past infection vaccination information and really refine the risk. And it provides you with a weather forecast of whether you have any connections with cases and how close they're coming to you and how far away they seem to be so you can take action. And these was developed by mathematicians at Carnegie Mellon and it's being used in a few places around, but sadly it was generated during the pandemic so no one's really adopted it. But it, it is like an early warning system in terms of predicting identity. And it uses information in a way that is matched towards the full set of decisions that people need to make. The point about going through this is that many problems have this same structure that relate to the importance of knowing who you are dealing with in a big data problem. You want to predict the identity of the person so that you can assign various things to them and then take actions. This happens in public health tracking, knowing what a person's life history is regarding medical procedures. This happens in vaccine and testing completions, knowing has someone been tested recently or been vaccinated recently and then tying it to that individual person. This is certainly the whole job of ad targeting, knowing who you are likely dealing with so you can serve up the right ads to them. This happens with recommendation share engines, things that suggest the things that you buy online. And of course, it's a big factor in credit risk. And for each of these predicting of identity, there's an associated action that's being informed. Isolation and follow-up, passports for entry, relevant ads, relevant matches, and price risk for credit risk. Who holds the action drives the privacy trade-off in each of these things. It's the action, much less than the information, that drives those privacy trade-offs and the ability to have people incentives impacted on by this, and also things like mimicking other forms of identity. So the issue of who owns information is, in my opinion, the wrong frame. We really need to consider who owns the decision for much of the dilemmas we face. And so we have to ask, what are the externalities? What are the conflicts of interest? Who has the other relevant information? And then we also have to ask is, are you actually dealing with the right decision? You're getting a signal, you're using it for a purpose. Is that the right decision that's being done? And which we saw in the pandemic information, that's not entirely clear.